So, two more slides, and then I, then I'm finished. So, looking at patient selection for you know, looking at, um, for example, using certain treatments, I think it's important to look at those antipsychotic medications like lorazidone and others, which have an improvement, obviously, on overall um, health outcomes, not just the positive negative symptoms or antidepressant type symptoms, uh, but also improve, you know, general well-being, physical well-being as well. Um, that gives us the best chance really to improve, you know, social outcomes um, in addition to biological outcomes here as well. Now, these are you are very well familiar with. So what is maybe an important part is to say, well, the, we have the core symptoms. We have also, in addition to that, cognitive symptoms, uh, um, emotional symptoms in, in schizophrenia, which we need to address more holistically uh, in addition to physical symptoms. And I could show you uh, the strategies for doing that. I think we arrive really in our field at a very practical level that we now start to monitor this, uh, these changes. We have medications available, we have lifestyle interventions available, nutrition available, uh, which improves those outcomes. And what is important really at the practical level is to say, well, um, how do we communicate this? So just measuring doesn't help us and doesn't help the patient in particular. So we need to clarify and discuss with the GP what their expectations is, whether they will do the monitoring, whether they will continue with the interventions, um, or whether it will be the psychiatrist and what the, what the regularity of that is um, and what the treatment goals there are. So that's really important to have a good communication here with GPs here um, on that point. So here, I thank you for your attention. We have time for questions. And if you're interested, you can look for updates on Twitter as well. Thank you very much. Right. Now is our opportunity for questions. Just to, to remind you that the speakers, and I may at times refer to off-label indications for various medicines in the course of the day, uh, that's not, of course, with the uh, authorization of Servier, but it's really part of our scientific discourse and discussion about this. So we've got a question here, and uh, here we are, about the slides being emailed. I think there'll be a case of talking with Servier representatives later will be the easiest way to manage about that. We just move on to the dose of lorazidone. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think the question is here 40, 80, and 160 milligrams. Um, it really depends, um, and we've seen the studies, if you look at the, the, the efficacy of the studies, they use the range between 40, 80, and 120 milligram, 160 milligrams, depending on the type of study. Higher dose are usually recommended, obviously, um, for, for more efficacy in uh, antipsychotic um, effects, but you know, smaller dose, maybe in the long term, medium type dose, 80 milligrams, might be uh, you know, efficacious as well. So it really depends on the clinical situation, but the whole range is um, obviously useful. And that dosing issue, is akathisia dose dependent? Well, not really, not really. They're, they're, the, the, you don't, get the, in terms of the side effect profile, um, there's not much dose dependence there. Previous listing, uh, I'm not sure. I think there'll be a matter for Servier, and maybe a Servier representative later today can tell us when this magic is going to happen. I suspect when the compound falls into generic uh, territory, but hopefully sooner. Uh, next question. Reversing weight gain. Um, which one is it? Sorry, this one there. What percent of people can reverse the weight gain on seizing olanzapine? Well, it's... Um, I think the effects, as you have seen, is quite dramatic. So you see a lot of change in, in weight gain. Because with lorazidone, for example, there's no change in, in weight uh, between baseline and week six, week eight of the studies. If you reduce it from olanzapine, you can actually reduce it, depending on where you change to, you can reduce it from uh, 30, 40, 50 percent to zero, depending on the type of medication switched to. Mm -hmm. Question about EEG, baseline. Yes, though that, that is recommended uh, to do EEG at baseline. Um, the college recommends that at, um, at months 12. There was no recommendation to do the EEG again. I would suggest to do an EEG, EEG um, once per year. What are you expecting from that? What are you looking for? What is the reason for it? Or is it just uh, engaging uh, electroencephalographers in work? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good point too. 
But I have to say, you know, I was trained first as a neurologist, so I like EEG, um, okay. and, I, and, I, and I know what, what one can see in EEGs. Um, to look at, looking at the, the change in threshold uh, for epileptic fits, I think that's an important part. And we only can do that really if we do that more regularly. And even from a neurological point of view, you, even twice per year is not enough because sure. you may actually miss that. Yeah. Um, so therefore, I'm a little bit inclined to recommend that to do more regularly. Ordering too many tests. Uh, too many tests, yeah, well, um, too many tests, depending on what type of tests. I mean, the, as I said before, looking at one test only or the one metabolic component only will not really inform the overall picture. So therefore, we need to you know, tick the box for various tests to get a, a global picture. Um, and that's been recommended, as you can see, at least twice per year, so at baseline and year one. Um, follow up, but also in the meantime, you know, week 12, week 24, so do that more regularly. I think that's really important. Um, and the costs for that, okay, um, that can be high for some patients if, if not covered by health insurance, but I think it's worth the effort to do that. Uh, I'm a minimalist and tend to use one agent and try to use it well. I was interested that a third of people had more than one antipsychotic, and there's a question here about. Uh, whether you are adding comorbidities and greater atherogenic risk rather than benefit? Well, that, that is the, 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 the key clinical question. What is the ratio between the benefit and the risk? Um, but I think once we get maybe a, a patient coming to us being on, on two or, or more medications, we need to assess the benefit and the risk uh, in these particular patients. And adding an antidepressant is worthwhile if your patient with schizophrenia exactly. is online psychotic and depressed. Exactly, exactly. So not assuming that the, 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 the depressed symptoms or the anxious symptoms are just part of schizophrenia and, and, um, and go away if the schizophrenia is treated well, that would be uh, a limited um, uh, view on increasing you know, efficacy of medications. Hmm. Why is Vortioxin listed as second line? Can you speak for the college? Yeah, well, it, well that, the, the guidelines, I think, when did they come out? 2015? So at that mm -hmm. time, um, for, so the college guidelines for mood disorder, I think at that time the, the drug was just, had just started in Australia in early 2015, so maybe they didn't have much uh, data on that yet, right. experience yet, but it may have changed, I don't, I'm not sure. It was the data, I don't think data were yeah. available at that stage. Exactly, yeah. In the 1970s, there was a real concern that antidepressants might worsen psychosis, but there's an issue question here, which specific antipsychotics worsen depression? <laughs> Good question. So which antipsychotic would worsen depression? I think it, it you know, you can't globalize that answer because it really depends on the type of patient with depression and what type of patient uh, that is, whether they have agitation. Mm -hmm. So in an agitated, depressed patient, an antipsychotic with, um, uh, you know, some, some uh, um, um, sort of effects on agitation might actually be helpful. Whereas in a patient, obviously, who has uh, hypersomnolence, you know, antipsychotic with, with um, uh, um, you know, antiasminergic effects might not help very much. So it really depends on the type of symptoms the patient presents with. Uh, but some antipsychotic may actually worsen the, the effects there. Okay, we've got time for a couple of questions about metformin to begin with. Metformin, where's that question? Top here. Yeah, up on top. Well, <clears throat> I'm a little bit cautious with metformin. I know it's used very widely, but the, the data uh, um, base is very, very thin. And there's really no, not much controlled studies of uh, when to use metformin, at what point in time, for how long, at what dosage. Um, so therefore, I would be a little bit cautious with that, to be honest. Okay. And other antipsychotics like aripiprazole, acenapine, and their effects on cognition and metabolic? Yes. Uh, as you have seen, the, um, the newer ones which are listed here, aripiprazole, acenapine, have a better metabolic profile overall. And um, some of the data also suggests that there are positive effects on cognition as well. So certainly these drugs and, and um, lorazidone, for example, are better from a metabolic profile. And hyperprolactinemia management? Well, um, here again, you know, the management is obviously depending on the type of drug um, you're using. So using a drug which has a lower risk is probably more important. So measuring 
prolactin levels is part of that, not just going by risk factors, but managing it includes also measurement. And I think what I said today and all the different data shown, it really speaks to a measurement-based you know, approach to psychiatry rather than a risk-based approach. Yeah. And just, I've taken a poetic view of the last couple of questions, but there's an important one here. Difference in lifestyle and lifestyle only in the MMAP intervention. You referred to two yeah, categories. That's right. So lifestyle means that there was lifestyle plus anything else. So lifestyle could be part of any type of you know, additional interventions or lifestyle only. And lifestyle only was uh, used in 23% um, of the cases, whereas lifestyle more generally, and that's encouraging, as an intervention in addition to medications has been used in more than 80% of the cases. So that is really encouraging that lifestyle is, has become part of our approach to mental illness and here in schizophrenia in particular. As you can see, there are more questions. There are going to be more questions again through the day. Unfortunately, uh, Professor Byron is not going to be able to stay. I know you've got a plane to catch. Uh, I, I hope they have uh, super refreshments on that plane for you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very, you very much. much. We've done a fantastic Thanks. presentation. Thanks very much. Thanks very Thank much you. indeed. Thank you. All Thanks. Thanks.